Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this, this uh, plenary session on the World Economic Outlook. I'm Vikram Khanna. I'm the associate editor of the Straits Times in Singapore, and it's a pleasure to share, chair this session. Um, of course, this is a huge topic. Uh, we can talk about many things. Uh, just to set the stage, let me just make a few observations on some of the key ideas uh, that we might be able to discuss. Uh, one is that, of course, the, the broad contours of the world economy look quite good. The United States is in the eighth year of its recovery. Uh, Europe is also recovering now after almost a decade of weak growth. We heard from Minister uh, Maria Marquez that even Portugal grew at quite an impressive 2.7% last year. Japan is looking quite good as well and even shows signs of overcoming deflation. Uh, China and India are powering ahead. Uh, the part of the world where I come from, Southeast Asia, that's doing quite well too. But overlaid on this sort of broad, broadly positive picture, there are some, some worrying signs. Um, Thank you. One is that we've had a decade of near zero interest rates, and, which, uh, which, and that crutch is now being taken away. So it remains <coughs> to be seen what, what <coughs> risks have been hidden that will now come into view. Um, then we have the, the rise of populism as reflected in the Brexit vote and the election of Donald Trump and the, the rise of populist uh, leaders in Europe, especially Eastern Europe, but not only Eastern Europe, including Western Europe as well. We've had a retreat from globalization and free trade. Um, we've uh, seen the rise of protectionism most significantly and scarily in the United States. Um, and you have to wonder how this is going to play out and what the end game will be. Um, there's also something that has not been much discussed during this uh, conference so far, and that is the shift in the balance of economic power from the West to the East. Um, and many, many observers view the protectionist actions by the United States against China, not just as part of a trade skirmish, but as something bigger. Uh, it's of an incumbent leading power trying to stop or slow down the rise of an emerging power. Um, it's very significant, I think, that the United States has targeted the China 2025 program, which is China's attempt to sort of um, power ahead in 10 key industries of the future. Um, then, of course, we've had disruption in industry after industry in the face of new technologies like artificial intelligence, robotics, the Internet of Things, uh, data, uh, and, and potentially blockchain. Uh, and we've had new business models, the platformification of various, uh, various industries, um, and the emergence of near monopolies. Uh, and we've seen the disruption happen in industry after industry, We've seen it in travel, in hospitality, in retail, in financial services, in manufacturing, in finance, in even my own industry, the media. So this, of course, has huge implications, uh, not only for the future of these industries, but also for the future of employment, future of jobs. We heard yesterday, I think, that two-thirds of students studying today will be in jobs that have not, we have not heard of yet uh, when they start working. Um, and, of course, it has huge implications for the, the future of the global economy. Now, so, so these are a whole lot of issues. I'm not sure we'll have time enough to cover all of them, uh, but we'll do our best. Um, we have a very distinguished panel to deal with many of these issues. They are divided into two camps and sitting on each side of me. One is the corporate, <laughs> corporate camp is here, yeah. um, and the central banking camp is here. <laughs> And uh, these are the people who, who create the environment in which we all operate. So we have to pay them great respect. <laughs> <laughs> the corporate people, of course, are leading the changes that are happening. Um, if I may introduce them very briefly, uh, to my far left is uh, Mr. Mohandas Pai, who's chairman of the, the Global Manipal Education uh, System. Uh, he's, of course, much more than that. He's a, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's a pioneer of India's IT industry, and he's a mentor. He's also a venture capitalist. 
Uh, to my immediate left is Mr. Nobuyuki Ide, um, who is the former chairman and CEO of Sony. Um, he's 80 years old and refuses to retire. Um, he told me that he can't retire from himself. <laughs> so he's now uh, basically spends most of his time mentoring young, young companies, uh, both in Japan and in, and in China. Uh, to my immediate right is Timothy Lane, my former colleague at the IMF um, during the 1980s and early 90s. I left in the early 90s, but he stayed on. And then he, he, he stayed on for, I think, 20 years odd. Yeah. And then he went on to become the deputy governor of the Bank of Canada, where he now is. Um, and to his right is Mr. Pedro Neves. Um, he's the, the representative from Portugal, the only representative of Portugal on this panel. He's the alternative chairperson of the European Banking Authority. So, gentlemen, if I may ask um, each panelist to basically just speak for three or four minutes first on their own perspective of how, how they see the, 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 the outlook. Starting with Mr. Pai. Uh, Vikram, thank you very much. My thesis is that we are living in the age of disruption, and we're going to see very rapid change in the next 15 years. In 1820, a set of events started in Great Britain which changed the world, which led to Europe dominating for the next maybe 200 years. And now in the age of disruption, China and India are going to come back and become the dominant economies by 2030. Now, disruption is happening because of technology. Computing power has expanded tremendously because of the cloud, with quantum computing coming in, with IoT coming in. We're going to see a new normal in society. The internet has leveled the field. So we have today 6 billion people on the internet. And all 7.6 billion people could be on the internet. 3.5 billion people have smartphones. And if everybody's on the internet with smartphones, we're going to see the creation of a first global platform where everybody could interact. The largest country in the world today is Facebook with 2.2 billion people. Now, how is it impacting industries? The oil industry, because of fracking led by technology, has lost $2 trillion. And because of the loss of $2 trillion due to price reduction and fracking, and America coming back, we're seeing politics in the Middle East change dramatically with Prince Salman. Wahhabi terrorism could come down because of a clampdown and lack of money. In the auto industry, which makes 90 million vehicles a year of $2 trillion, we're seeing the rise of the electric car. An electric car has 20 moving parts, an IC engine has 2,000 moving parts. An electric car costs $1,500 to maintain a year, and the IC engine costs $10,500. And by 2030, 60% of world production will be electric cars. A 100-year-old IC industry is under threat, and the electric car can go up to 500,000 kilometers as against 150,000 kilometers. With autonomous cars self-driving themselves and with the auto industry coming in, we're going to see tremendous change in the industry where one in six people are employed currently. We're seeing change come in utilities. By 2030, 30% of world energy will be alternate energy. In June of last year, for the first time in 200 years, the UK had 100% of its power from non-coal sources. So when alternate energy becomes dominant, the existing power system will, will be less of value. In the United States, the entire utility industry has become a cell, and Europe, the largest company, has broken up into a wind, alternate energy, transmission, I mean, uh, transmission energy, and a generating industry. We've seen things happening in manufacturing. Manufacturing so far has been reductive manufacturing, where you take a metal, cut the pieces, and get a part. Now it's additive manufacturing. 3D printing will make sure that about you can print anything out in, in a normal place. Cars have been printed, racing engines have been printed, rocket engines have been printed, houses have been printed. So you can sit down on a PC, order a car, and design it from Bangalore, and press a button. In the next door shop, the car can be printed for you. So what happens to the global supply chain? That's getting disrupted in a very big way. The life science industry is getting disrupted by bespoke medicine, DNA medicine, stem cell research, robotic surgery, and brain research, etc. So human beings will live up to 100, 120. And the rich are going to live longer. And if people live longer, they age gracefully, you can imagine that they don't want any more babies. Why make a baby when you can live longer? And as it is, the aging problem in Europe and the US is seeing tremendous change. In the United States, we have seen the last two years more non-white babies born than white babies. And in the United States, the Hispanics will be the largest community by 2045. It's supposed to be 2050, and now it's 2045. If ethnic change happens in the United States, it will impact global politics. 
And then you are seeing in the financial industry, disruption in banking. Banks are shrinking, the payment system is getting disrupted, the stock market uh, trading is going on to bots, robo-finance is coming in, we are having automated trading happening, and the entire global finance system is getting disrupted by small startups. Now, all this disruption will have an impact on society. Along with robotics and automation, people's lives are getting impacted. In the United States, for the last 15 years, 10 million jobs have been automated. The rise of Trump is because of the lack of jobs. The middle class income has not risen for 15 years. And now, along with the rise of Asia, because they're growing faster, a change in global power with China, India dominating back up to 200 years, we're going to see very interesting stuff. So life is going to be totally interesting by 2030. And I think with the midst of this great disruption, and the most important point is, is a short period of time. In 15 years, we're going to see more change than we saw in the last 60 years. Will human beings react? We don't know. And in the age of robots, where robots can do 35, 40% of people's work, we have to think how to keep people employed, and that's a bigger story. Thank you, Mr. Pai. I think we'll go into some of the societal changes that you mentioned later on. Uh, Mr. Ide, uh, you were showing us a graph of... No, no, he covered everything, so... <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, you give us your, your, from your long experience. Uh, just the experience that I, you said, uh, I'm 80 years old, so he said, why don't you don't retire? So there's no word for retire from me, because uh, pe people longevity, longevity uh, 100 years. So if you divide your life up by four, Fast like, like a Symphony 9 of Beethoven, it's 25 years, <laughs> or 50, 75. That means I am a fourth act of music, <clears> only <throat> five, year, five, five years old. Right. I'm very young, you know? Yes, of course, <laughs> yes, of course. And your mind so, is very young, too. Yeah, this is a life. <laughs> you know, I mean, people enjoy life. I, I don't like the word disruptive. It's a you know, disruptive world is based on today but we have to be creative for the next society, for better life for the people. Maybe we have to compete. We have to think how to compete against AI robotics, but I don't believe, you know, a robot creates something new from nothing. Maybe the, the robot make kind of many, many composing of the music by, by big, big data, but be crea crea creative robot is very difficult. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very cautiously optimistic about the future of the world, but we have to make big efforts to make a new kind of new, new, new society. So in, in Japan, where well, I joined Sony in 1960, so 60, 70, 80, Japan was really said Japan's number one at 21st, 21st century Japan, but it did not happen. Okay? It's after 1990, so internet introduced in the world. So Japan, uh, many people use, I mean, internet, but we failed to create new value or new industry using internet. But only a few companies made it, you know. You, can, you, you may know that, I mean, many people said GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon in America, only four. But in China, the three companies, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, if you, you make, you, if you make a kind of list of the uh, biggest market cap of the world, these eight companies, or seven companies, I mean, <laughs> dominate the world. So I believe new paradigm coming soon. That means new paradigm, uh, change of technology, creates a new business opportunity or bu new business model. So when, if you see the New York of uh, uh, 1900, uh, uh, like, you know, it's uh, the horse. Yes. Yes. The, the world of horse. But, you know, 20, 30 years after, it's a kind of general motor. It's a kind of automobile society. It's a paradigm change. But that kind of paradigm change is coming very soon. So I, I want to mention two industry, uh, two technologies very important, which is, uh, of course, Artificial intelligence is, uh, the, I mean, is very important, but I think more importantly is a trusted, trusted internet, other word is blockchain. But in addition to current internet, blockchain is a trusted internet. So maybe this industry will hit the financial industry, bank, 
or the financial industry. However, I mean, Estonia is a good example that the world, I mean, country using blockchain already in a part of administration. So, but I think blockchain is a quite strong power to change the society. So this is my point that we want to follow, give you next speaker. Sure, I, I, I would like to explore uh, your own experience with disruption over your long career. And yes. Yes. I, I, I would like to go into that. Uh, yeah, give me a few hours, one hour, I can explain <laughs> in detail. <laughs> Tim, uh, from your yes. point of view? Yes, okay. Well, um, and uh, Vikram, you've already touched on, uh, on, on some of the main themes, but, uh, and, and the, other, the other panelists also. But uh, I mean, I think it's a, certainly agree that this is uh, looking like a uh, much more favorable period <coughs> in the global economy. We've had a decade of lackluster or uh, often uh, worse than that uh, economic performance globally and, uh, and growth has been very uneven, but we're now seeing what looks like a very synchronous uh, global economic expansion. Um, I mean, there's been some choppiness in the data. People worry about the weak first quarter in Europe and that kind of thing. But our sense is that, is that there are some temporary factors, but broadly, the things seem to be on a much better track. But of course, as economists, um, I mean, we're, we're professional worriers, and that's probably even more true of central bank economists and maybe even more true of central bank economists who used to work at the IMF. But, um, but, but uh, you know, so, so certainly there are some things that we need to, uh, need to think about. And I think maybe one thing I'd stress, which uh, is the fact that uh, the growth that we're currently seeing is very heavily reliant on continued economic stimulus. And you know, we still have uh, uh, central banks keeping interest rates very low and elements of, uh, of, of unconventional policy still in place in many economies, notably in Japan and also in Europe. Um, it's going to have to, uh, you know, we're at some point, at, you know, sooner or later and at different timing and in different paces in different places going to be confronting the challenge of how to unwind that stimulus uh, without causing disruption. And that's particularly an issue because, you know, as you mentioned, Vikram, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, world financial system has been distorted in many respects by 10 years of negative real interest rates. And we've seen that search for yield, which has gone into all kinds of places. I think uh, uh, one question, big question mark, is how much uh, what we're seeing in long-term uh, interest rates or long-term bond yields is actually reflecting that search for yield. And, and, uh, and, and there's you know, still, I think, many people are, are increasingly concerned about a possible snack back in, in, in long-term bond yields. And that's, you know, in, 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 and, and it's important to, to bear in mind there that long-term bonds are, are viewed as one of the safe assets in the system. So if there's a sharp repricing of, of those assets, that could have pretty disruptive effects more generally. Um, it also, I mean, there are also a number of other assets, equities, for example, commodities, uh, and, and, and so on, that, that look like they're reasonably priced if you believe the, uh, the long-term bond uh, yields that are used to discount the returns on those things. But of course, if you have a sharp snapback, then a lot of those other prices look uh, look like they're they're not uh, in touch with reality either. So so that's that's one of the uh, the sort of classes of risks is is the sort of financial vulnerabilities. Um, a second is the um, is is the, uh, um, the 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 fact that even as we come into this period of synchronous expansion, it's on a lower track than before. And a lot of that is the fact that in 10 years, we've seen further demographic change, which has meant that labor, force, uh, labor forces have been growing more, um, more slowly and uh, even negative rates in some countries, notably Japan. But, um, but certainly, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the future is not what it used to be. Um, and, uh, and, that's, uh, and, and that's a factor that, uh, that everybody's having conf to confront. I think to maintain some decent level of economic growth, of course, we need productivity growth. And that means, of course, embracing technical changes. Um, but as, uh, as, as Mohanda and, and uh, uh, I think already uh, stressed, I mean, there's an inherent element of disruption in that technical change. And I think it's important here to bear in mind, you can't have the, you can't have the advancement without the disruption. This is the point that, that uh, many years ago Schumpeter made, the, you know, where he coined the term creative destruction, that uh, in effect, it's, it's, it's the, the new replaces the old. And, 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 and the, the problem then is not, um, is not how to, how, how to, how to do it all smoothly. The problem is just how to manage the consequences, and that means um, that means uh, how to um, you know how, how to, to 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 help the people adjust. Um, 
while accepting the fact that some industries and jobs are probably going to disappear. And uh, I think at this point, of course, we've got, you know, I mentioned the demographics, on the other hand, the technical changes, and these two forces are working simultaneously. And so, whereas I think people looking only at the technology talk about how, well, you know, in the future, nobody's going to have a job. I mean, the reality of right now is that we're actually getting slower growth because we don't have enough workers to, to fill the jobs that would be created at a decent uh, rate of economic growth. And so, I mean, we have the, the, the case in the US, for example, where we've got shortages of labor for some areas. And on the other hand, we have this problem of the, the sort of uh, uh, middle-aged men who've been cast aside because they're, the industries they work for um, uh, uh, shrank and uh, they've been replaced by, either by technology or by, uh, or, or by outsourcing. And, and uh, there really hasn't been a good job done of of, 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 of moving them. And of course, that brings me to the third risk, which is, the, uh, which is around the political context and uh, you know, the fact that, that a lot, you know, as uh, Mohandas said, the, 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 uh, the, uh, this kind of technological disruption inherently does bring uh, uh, discontentment. I mean, that's of course only one of the sources of, uh, of, of the kind of political turmoil we've seen in many advanced economies, late, advanced countries lately. Um, uh, but of course, one of the important consequences is this whole um, uh, political uh, uh, re reaction against globalization and technology, which, uh, which is reflected in some of the protectionist forces. And you know, there, I think the, uh, the concern is, uh, from an economic point of view, is not just what, what can happen, because you know, when you look at the range of outcomes of the current uh, spate of trade disputes, it's possible that even some good things could happen, some increased openness in some areas. Um, it's also uh, uh, possible that some very negative things can happen. But, um, but I think the, the, the issue at this point is that as long as the uncertainty drags on, that in itself is a problem. It, uh, it, it means that uh, a lot of businesses are reluctant to invest in areas where they are afraid that they might be blindsided by changes in trade, uh, uh, in, in trade uh, uh, arrangements. And so, uh, so we see that in Canada where, of course, NAFTA is in play, but I think it's really a phenomenon that's probably much wider, uh, wider spread. And uh, of course, I, I guess maybe just to finish that thought, uh, you know, uh, the day before yesterday was the 200th anniversary of the birth of Karl Marx. And uh, I think this would be a good time to remember that economic forces are a powerful driver of political developments. And that was certainly one of Marx's uh, greatest uh, insights, and, uh, and it's one that we should keep in front of us. Not every day that we hear a central <laughs> banker mm. quoting Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Tim. Um, Pedro, um, your perspective maybe on the state of Europe and the banking system. Uh, so good morning to everyone. Let me first start by thanking uh, Frank, Richard, and Lazis for having invited me to be here today. Uh, to the usual disclaimer, I will express my own views, not necessarily those of the European Banking Authority or Bank of Portugal. And of course, to compliment the moderator and my colleagues today in the panel. I will speak briefly on the current economic environment and then to what is expected for the next um, decade. So, as far as the current economic outlook uh, is concerned, I mean, I share previous views. We are sharing a period of uh, strong growth. Um, if you um, see the recent uh, projections by the IMF, uh, world GDP and world trade are supposed to peak this year, 2018. Consumer confidence levels and economic sentiment index are very high levels across the globe. Uh, and uh, the profile of growth, even the profile of growth, is characterized by strong investment and strong exports, which is a good uh, sign. And um, if you just allow me, unemployment is everywhere in the globe at very low levels. 24-year uh, low in Japan, 42-year uh, low in Canada and in the UK, 18-year low in the US, and a 10-year low in the European Union. So this is a very mature expansion, and we can say that the sun is shining. Concerning risks, and Tim mentioned already that, so I will not uh, repeat, uh, I just 
focus on the protectionism, which of course can be a major setback for the current recovery. And uh, second, it's important to mention that uh, there is a vulnerability uh, concerning the high, level, high levels of debt across the globe, which are even higher than they were uh, before the past financial crisis. So when the time, when the sun is shining, we used to say in Portugal that the time has come to fix the roof. Mm -hmm. We say that in Portugal, and I think we say that everywhere in the world as well. So this is timing to improve resilience in the banking sector, and as a matter of fact, banks are increasing capital. Um, it is important to build buffers in other sides of the economy, like in firms, public sector, and it's important to um, do some reforms that could increase and raise productivity. Now, I will move to the next decade, and very much in line with what was said before in this panel, I see three main changes, three main trends affecting what is going to happen in the next decade. So the first one is, of course, demographics and aging. Just uh, some uh, estimates by Bain, the consultant, over the next decade, labor force growth is supposed to be per year minus 0.5% in Europe, plus 0.5% in the US, and that is around one percentage point less than in the previous decade. So that will affect potential growth. Uh, aging will lead us in 2013 to a median age of 45 years in Europe, 40 years in the US, 35 years in Asia, around the same in Latin America, and 21 years only in Africa. So that's the first one, demographic trends. Uh, automation, I mean, two recent studies, the OECD was already mentioned in other sessions, and a recent uh, PwC uh, study indicate that around one-sixth of current jobs will be affected by automation over the next uh, decade. So that's the second main trend. And third, and Vikram mentioned that uh, at, at the beginning, I mean, there will be a you shift in the economic world power. And just to give you uh, some figures on that, if we compare, and I'll be using purchasing power parities because they're the ones that uh, are at uh, the PwC study that I, I saw. If we compare G7 with E7, being E7, China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, and Turkey, if we compare G7 with E7, in 95, E7 was about half of G7 in purchasing power parities. Today, E7 is about the same size of G7 in purchasing power parities. And by 2040, E7 will be the double of G7. So there will be a huge shift in the economic willpower. I mean, the fast growing economies in the next decade are supposed to be. India, of course, Vietnam, and Bangladesh. Uh, th there are other important conditioning factors that were already mentioned in other panels, like rising inequality, climate change, climate change and resource scarcity, and I mean, all the political uh, aspects, uh, so I will not mention there. So what are the likely effects of those trends, uh, I mean, in, in, in the economies? And I see uh, three of them. So first, uh, strong competition for skilled labor. So skilled labor will become even more scarce than probably it is today. That's first. Second, uh, an important change in consumption profiles due to aging in Europe and, and, and in the US. Uh, of course, you are also observing digital-like changes in the preferences. Uh, but another important aspect is that the new consumption power will be in the current emerging economies, and not uh, in uh, the, the I'd say the most uh, the referred as most advanced economies. So that will be an important change in consumption profiles. And third, and that of course is not clear, but it's um, I mean my assessment is that volatility is probably like to increase um, due to I mean disruption process, like uh, automation, uh, usually there is more volatility in emerging 
than advancing economies. And, I mean, inequality is also likely to bring some volatility. So those are the three main changes that I see. I mean, how should uh, we succeed? And, I mean, um, Orazis has always the perspective view uh, on the future. Uh, I think that as far as public sector and the government is concerned, a need to invest more and more in education uh, and enhancing so, um, social safety nets, uh, because it's probably the case that some costs in this transition process will emerge. Um, and firms, I mean, I think have to do the best on operational efficiency, costs reductions, uh, explore new distribution channels, to do as most as possible in innovation, of course, um, explore new markets because there will be a, a very important shift in the weight of uh, relative markets, training of staff, and as a general principle, build resilience to address uh, more volatility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neves. Um, we'll pursue some of those themes as we go along. Um, but let me just dig deeper into some of what you said, Mr. Pai. Uh, you talked so much about disruption and you described how it's happening on such a huge scale. Now, what, what will be the social impact of this disruption on society? Would you like to elaborate on that? Uh, before I answer that, I want to make a point to bring home this point of uh, what is happening. There is a digital monopoly around the globe. 90% of humans go to Google. Mm -hmm. Google knows what you do. It has a profile of what you do. And when you go and click and search, Google is sending you information it wants you to see, not what you want to get. So minds are being controlled by these digital monopolies like a Google and Facebook. Facebook does a psychometric analysis of your persona where you are gone, what you are seeing, what your likes are, and uses psychometric analysis, is able to do predictive analysis using big data to manipulate your mind. Now, the digital monopoly is a bigger threat to the world than standard oil was the US when the antitrust laws came into being. Now, imagine a world where a lot of work is automated, robots do much of the heavy lifting, the cars have become autonomous, and the digital monopolies who are trying to control your mind and they've got data, they know what to do, they can predict and they can analyze. And there is bioscience coming on, which is expanding the realm and remaking the human. What should people do? And the rich are going to get richer because the stock market rewards the disruptor and cycles, innovation cycles come down. Now, in democracies, the great mass of people vote and a small elite run the country, right? So now the, the opinion makers in the US and other places saying you must give them basic income. So you essentially guarantee to every human being a certain amount of money every month so they can leave without having to do too much work because there are not enough jobs going to be around. Now there are three kinds of jobs. The first job requires the left brain and the right brain, the logical and the creative part that will remain. It's very difficult to automate that and not worth it. Second job is individual performers like massiers, hairdressers. That could remain because it's not cost effective. 60% of humans work on rule-based jobs. Now, those rule-based jobs are going to shrink. That's why in the United States, in 15 years, the middle class has not seen a rise in the income, and 10 million jobs are gone. So their children are not going to see good jobs. It's gone, and it's not going to come back. It's happening in China. So what should you do with people? Basic income is one thing that has happened. We must restructure the way societies spend money. For example, Angela Merkel is on record to say, Europe has 25% of the world's GDP, spends 40% of the world's social spending. Is Europe investing enough in the future or the past? Most of the money is going to the past to maintain society, not investing in the children to prepare them for the digital world. And China is investing hugely in the future to prepare people for the digital world. So you see this kind of a thing happening. And then what do you do with people above 45? I think the biggest impact is going to be on people above 45 who are going to live longer because their jobs, which are highly paid now, right now, could get automated because it's cost effective. ROI is fantastic. And where will they go? They're not going to get their jobs back because those jobs can be done by a younger person and by a robo in many cases. So society has to come, understand, tackle digital monopolies by data privacy laws and other areas, maybe break them down and use the force of law. Second, create a social structure which can take care of those 45 years old plus who may be in difficulty. Third, look at basic income and remove all of the subsidies to have a direct income. And fourth, make sure that the society spends on digital, on the digital world to enable everybody to form their own work. 
For example, there's something called the jig economy. The jig economy is a place on the internet where you go and hire individual performers and specialists for tasks, and it's becoming bigger. The biggest job creation is the jig jig economy where people are becoming individualistic, and the globe is becoming a market. So we have to debate these new issues, come with solutions. Right now, it's a bit hazy. Thank you. This is an enormous agenda there today. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Ide, I was going to ask you, you, you have such a long experience of dealing with disruption from the time of the transistor in 1940s and 50s, uh, and then the microprocessor, and then the internet, and so on. Uh, now, do you think that the current wave of disruption that we are seeing in the form of these technologies, the new technologies, AI, IoT, blockchain, is bigger than anything you have seen in your lifetime? Is it more significant? And I, I would also like you to address the issue that Mr. Pai just raised about monopolies, digital monopolies, are these going to be with us for a long time? Or do you think they too will have a limited life? Well, when internet was introduced in uh, 1990, nobody, uh, uh, almost everybody really believed that new business would be created by a small cycle. And uh, we don't really, uh, 1995, I cannot imagine that uh, Facebook and uh, Amazon and also any big company control data. But this is, uh, I think, a very short period of time. The very next blockchain we introduced in addition to the internet. Internet is a, is a kind of chain of a copy. Copy, 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 copy. Okay. So it, it's a danger that one data can be copied 100 times. Okay. That is a reason that company can be getting automatically bigger, but if you combine blockchain and internet, probably they create a kind of new probably business model. So I'm not pessimistic about the future. People are always pessimistic about the future. If you go to the pyramid, there is a, it's a kind of, I mean, the world that today's young people is not, I mean, it, I mean criticized by the young generation, but you know, I really believe, believe that Big corporations are now trying to, to transform by themselves to create second second peak, like uh, in Japan the Toyota. I mean, I mean management very much decided to change the Toyota to the new generation. I don't know how to, but this is a big commitment from the Toyota. Of course, Sony also from from semiconductor to CPU and for the internet. And uh, I mean, uh, I mean, the, the better the company, difficult to transform. So that the management is make a kind of clear decision to adapt to, to create second peaks, not not depending on the first peak. Maybe we need a kind of second peaks. So sec second peak is uh, create. I mean. Um, it's a big, big duty of the management of the, such company like General Motors and also or um, many banks, uh, Mitsubishi Bank, Smith but also big major bank are very much committed to how to adapt the blockchain times, okay, digital currency itself. So, and also, I think I have a big hope for the new generation. The young generation create a new, 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 New business. For example, I found uh, one of the Japanese people. Uh, Shinsan, why don't you stand up? Well, I, I, I'll talk about your company. And he's a, a 35 years old uh, CEO of uh, microfinance in Asia and employ already a few hundred people. Is he one of your mentees? Is yes, one of my mentees, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he's, a, he's a Korean boy. Born in Japan, but he refused to make a Japan, to get a Japanese passport. Neither Korean, so he's he's a really global guy, okay? and uh, his he, his really dream is to make a private bank in Asia. So I think this kind of a generation make a tremendous, crazy, I mean, objectives. Okay. So I really believe that not only big corporation. And the younger generation create the new, new, new opportunity. 
So this is, I, I, I really see, I'm cautiously optimistic about the future, and including Japan. <laughs> including and also, Japan. Also Europe, too. That's wonderful to know. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, um, uh, uh, I've heard at, at one of these earlier sessions that central bankers have discovered this new tool of unconventional monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And so investors feel that there is a flaw to risk. If we get into trouble, the central bankers will always be there with zero interest rates to save us. So do you think, uh, do you think this will make investors more complacent? Or do you think, do you think, I mean, what can you do? What can you do to sort of make sure that there isn't this kind of moral hazard? Can I ask him something about central bank? Of course, yes. Okay. So I, I, I served advisor for Bank of Japan for nearly nine years as an independent person. But the, the role of central bank is changing if 20 years ago, today, and for the future. How do you see the role of central bank in the future? So you have two questions. Now. Okay. Well, those are, I mean, they're certainly related in the sense that, uh, uh, of course, in response to the global financial crisis and then the long uh, uh, period of, of uh, you know, weak economic performance since then, you know, we have had this, uh, this, this uh, ramping up of various unconventional measures. And, uh, and it has really taken central banks into new territory. I mean, they've been buying assets that they never, uh, both the kinds of things they've been buying, but also the scale in which they've done it has been very different than in the past. I mean, in Canada, we've been fortunate because we had a, uh, a banking system that actually came through the crisis uh, uh, largely un, uh, un, un, unscarred. And so, uh, and, and so we've had a bit of the opposite problem that, uh, that, that just maintaining low interest rates has been enough that we've had a buildup of, uh, of debt, particularly in the household sector, and we've had a bit of a housing bubble. But, uh, but the... Uh, but, but, but I think for many central banks, this, this has really been, uh, uh, this has been a very unconventional uh, time. And, and uh, I, I would say uh, it's a little too early to, uh, uh, to, to assess what the, uh, what the full impact of these things will be. But I think, I think generally there's a sense that these have contributed to supporting economic activity through this very difficult period. Um, uh, and, uh, and that there are tools that should be in the toolkit from now on. Um, but I think the important thing, as you, as you alluded to is, to, is that they be tools to support the economy, but not to prop up the markets. And of course, this, is, this issue of the, uh, you know, it was talked about in, in back in the era of, uh, of, of, of conventional policies, of, you know, the Greenspan put, you know, the sense that markets would, um, would, would expect that, uh, that if there were a dip in the markets, that, then the central bank would ease policy and that that would, uh, that would prevent further, further damage. And uh, of course, central banks do need to take account of financial developments in, um, in um, uh, they have to take account of financial developments in making monetary policy because, of course, the financial system has a, a huge impact on, on the way the economy is going to evolve. But, but, but I think it's very important to do that in a way that doesn't create that signal that, that, that the market itself is, is going to be the target. And uh, I, I think at this point, you know, um, uh, well, so far we've seen, um, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve, which I think is at the, at the center of this, has, has done a, a, a pretty good job of, of, of allowing some of the fluctuations in markets to take place, while it's, and at the same time clearly signaling that it's going to be on a path of withdrawing monetary policy stimulus. But I think, you know, we, we, it's something that really requires a care both in, in the way policy is conducted and also in communication. Fair enough. Yeah. But more broadly, I mean, the role of central banks, I think we're, uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, there are a number of areas where, where that has to be reconsidered. And part of it is the, the role of unconventional policies. And part of it is, is uh, how the financial system is integrated into, uh, in, into making monetary policy. And, you know, what we learned 10 years ago uh, if we didn't already know this from looking at, at countries around the world, was that, was that having uh, you know, stable, low stable and predictable inflation is not a sufficient condition for having a stable financial system. And that, you know, that, that was a lesson we learned uh, in a very painful way uh, uh, 10 years ago. It, it, and as, as, as I said, I mean, uh, it, it shouldn't have been a, a new lesson, but I think for many, many central bankers uh, it had been a l little bit put, put aside. But I think I think since then we've we've still been grappling with this question of how to how to how to uh, 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 reinforce financial stability while at the same time pursuing our mandate of uh, of, of, of stabilizing the real economy. Right. 
Uh, Mr. Ide, you advised the Bank of Japan, you said. Did you advise them to have zero interest rates? No, 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 this is the policy of Mr. Government Abe. Okay, okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, Mr. Neves, uh, we, we had a long discussion on Brexit yesterday, um, and in less than a year's time, the EU, uh, will, uh, Britain will no longer be in the EU, and the British uh, financial system will be outside the EU's banking system. Um, so what kind of risks will this pose, do you think? Well, <clears throat> first, of, uh, first of all, uh, of course, I'm not going to comment on the current negotiations, and no one of us know what will be the outcome of that, because it's unpredictable at this stage. Um, of course, uh, as, as Portuguese, as European, I regret very much that the uh, UK has decided to leave, but the decision uh, is taken. Uh, so what can we expect uh, for that? Um, I mean, to join a European Union for trade reasons is typically good, so leave a European Union will, in principle, have a negative impact for the British economy. Uh, there are some studies on that. I mean, GDP in the UK is expect to be impacted by some minus four, minus six, minus eight percentage points that it will be otherwise. And I think it will be uh, difficult to avoid that for the very good reason that to have uh, free trade is good, to have not um, free trade is, is, is not that good. Now, on the impact of uh, in, Linda, in London as a financial center, I think it's too early even to um, have uh, form an idea. Of course, some banks have already announced that would we'll leave uh, uh, London. Uh, Unilever, as well, has just announced that they decide to leave uh, uh, London. Um, it, it's probably worth mentioning that the Deputy Governor of Bank of England, uh, a good colleague of mine that is in charge by the Prudential Relation Authority, has just around one week ago, and that's why I mentioned the figure, update the estimate of job loss in the city to a minor one, minus one, minus two percent of the half of million people there. Um, there is uh, <clears throat> some uh, uh, expectations in London that um, London's reputation as a center for technical innovation could somewhat counteract the Brexit effect, so technical innovation is a key differentiator. differentiator. Um, there is also a recent suggestion by the Institute of Economic Affairs that London could make alliance with markets just as Hong Kong, Singapore, Switzerland, that it just came out two or three days ago, so that could eventually um, provide some integration opportunities. So, I mean, it, it's too early to say what will be the impact on, 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 on London from, from Brexit. There is, a, um, I can also mention a recent survey, a survey to FST um, senior executives, which they ask to answer the question, which cities are a competitive threat to London? And uh, I mean, that's their opinion. Let me just uh, borrow for this meeting. So Amsterdam is rising as an alternative competitive threat to London. Uh, Berlin is at high level, but somewhat declining. Chicago, curiously, is going up, and Frankfurt also going, going down. So, I mean, the main message here is the impact of Brexit as a city, as a financial center, still remains to be seen. Well, well let's hope for the best. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think uh, we have just a few minutes, uh, and uh, can I open it up to the floor? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, there's a lady here. Sorry, ladies first. Lady first. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, good morning. Marcia Dyson from Washington, D.C., an international uh, consultant working with some world leaders in the Middle East and Africa. And I've heard the uh, projection for uh, and the rise of India, and we hear what Japan and China is doing. Uh, President Obama, a few years ago, had an African Leadership Summit where he brought the presidents to the United States to talk about investment and the signaling of the World Economic Forum being held in Nigeria talked about the possibility of the emerging markets in Africa. And when you have billionaires like Tony Emil, you 
with telecommunications, investing in businesses in the United States. And as an African-American woman, I'm making it a point to bring in African-American business people whose value is worth 250 to almost a billion dollars to the continent. How do you see Africa as an emerging market in this whole global outlook? And also because of my work in the Middle East, I want to know how you might feel about what's happening in the GCC conflict, how that might disrupt within that particular uh, region of the world into the global market and the security as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, maybe Mohandas, you had mentioned some of the changes in, in the Middle East uh, as part of the disruption. I think Africa and the Middle East, uh, how do you see yeah. these emerging frontier uh, economies? You know, the Middle East has to reckon with this new future in the place when oil is going to decline as a price commodity. Mm -hmm. Because uh, most predictions are that oil is peaking in consumption, not in production. Production is going to go. The U.S. will be the largest producer in the next three, four months, overtaking Russia. And the surplus of 750 billion that uh, Saudi Arabia had has already come to 500 billion. And Prince Salman is trying to reconfigure the whole of the Middle East. And the Middle East is a very young country brought up on entitlement, where the government supplies everything. And now they got this conflict, and they have to get out of conflict. And Wahhabi terrorism is the heart of it. So I think it will remain on the boil for the next 10 years. So I don't see much change happening despite Salman coming there and doing many things because you need a young population hungry to work, which is very creative to take advantage of the new opportunities happening. And that is not there at this point of time. I travel to UAE very often, and I see that it's business as usual with a very clustered local population. Now, Africa is very interesting. There are a lot of innovations coming up in Nigeria. They're coming up in Kenya and they're coming up a little bit in South Africa. So we've got to see how they grow. But the gap between what Africa is today and the normal that is there in the rest of the world is expanding. I don't know how they're going to fill in the gap because fertility rates are very high. They're going to expand their population, and they're running out of, they're running out of I mean, food is important for them. They have to grow it. They're growing at 6%. Sub-Saharan Africa has grown at 6% a year in the last decade. They could grow faster. But how do you get the best of technologies to leapfrog the earlier industrial area? I'm not very sure, because they're still stuck in a little bit of the rut. India, too, is somewhere in the middle. A part of India is very ahead. A large part of India is behind. Now, the question for us in India is, will 300 million people pull up the 1 billion people to give them what they want? And we have been slightly successful because 1.2 billion people have got a biometric ID. 1.2 billion at a cost of only 1.8 billion. It's unbelievable. We have 1.1 billion bank accounts. We have 1.2 billion mobile connections. Eight, 900 million unique connections. 350 million smartphones. Now Reliance Geo is going to give 300 million smartphones. If we're able to connect them to the web and bring them up in the next five years, that could be the model for Africa too. Well, Africa at least will not have a labor shortage. No. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Timothy Lane. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned about the fact that Canada avoided the 2008 crisis. Uh, I think it was primarily because the threshold for mortgage and housing was greater than in the U.S. and other countries, as well as the fact that the Chrétien government refused to merge the merger of uh, the major Canadian banks. Uh, my question is with respect to the current situation yeah, at NAF NAFTA. Do you think this would be a catalyst for greater diversification to strengthen the current relationship, trade relationship with Mexico and Chile, as well as CETA and the TPP? And what are the chances that CETA will be successful, transatlantic with Europe? Well, certainly, uh, um, you know, the uncertainties around NAFTA uh, are a, a, a drive towards uh, more diversification of Can Canada's trade relations, and uh, you know that, and you know we've seen that with the uh, w with the TPP uh, membership and uh, and and various other uh, initiatives that have been taken to try and expand our trade relations, and I think those are all positive steps. Uh, I, I think I think uh, uh, the, the, the another element of the diversification that. Uh, that, that we hope will continue is, is uh, you know, deepening our ties with the ra rapidly growing emerging market economies, in, including India and China, and uh, and and uh, you know that's been uh, you know that's been a theme of, of Canadian trade for a while. But at the same time, I have to stress that geography 
is a very powerful force. And uh, you know, Canada is a country of 30 million people, uh, most of, sort of 90 percent of whom live within 100 kilometers or so of the uh, of, of the U.S. border, and you know, in, in a country of 300 or so million. And, uh, and 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 so about three quarters of our trade is still with the U.S. So in that context, you know, I think the, the diversification is helping, but I think it doesn't actually um, it doesn't actually uh, 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 get to the stage of, um, of, of insulating us from, uh, from the effects of, of the potential disruption of, of changing trading relationships. Um, yes, the lady there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this uh, very interesting panel uh, representing uh, European issuers, so companies quoted on the stock exchange to the AU. And my question is about the trends that you observe in the regulatory developments. I mean, we observe a lot of regulation uh, in Europe. Uh, what recommendation would you do for policymakers to support companies' growth in the future? Thank you. Mr. Nevis, I think that might be for you. Yeah, um, just so what I can <clears throat> comment uh, on this is uh, what is the role that the European Banking Authority uh, is doing. Um, as, 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 as I mean, the, the European body uh, that uh, is more concerned with the regulation of the banking sector. And basically what uh, the EBA is trying to do is to be the guardian of the single rule book, uh, making sure that a single set of prudential and conduct rules uh, apply at European space, just as to ensure a level playing field. Uh, the EBA has also done <clears throat> a job in contributing to the new paradigm of more and better capital in the banking sector, and um, capital levels in the banking sector are probably twice as much as they were before uh, the crisis, and that is done through the adoption of common definitions and rigorous monitoring of issues of new capital instruments. Um, on top of that, there is a yearly transparency exercise that provides information on the largest 130 EU banks on variables like capital ratios, leverage ratios, exposures, profits and losses, etc. Um, we are doing some peer reviews on convergency of supervisory practices, and there is also a very um, substantial job on the area of consumer protection and financial innovation. So that's what is happening on the regulation side. Uh, <clears throat> more EU um, uh, case, we have the European Banking Union, which has already a single supervisory mechanism, which was installed in a very short period of time. Uh, and there is the need to complete the Banking Union by having a pillar for deposit guarantee scheme, and as well to have a backstop for the resolution pillar. So, I mean, there is still some work to do, but um, I mean, there was uh, very substantial work over the last couple of years. Thank you. Mr. Ide, sorry, I have one last question. For I'll just come to you in just a minute. Um, we talked outside about the United States and China. These are the two superpowers of technology today. Um, they're two completely different systems. Um, on the one hand, uh, well, China has an advantage first. There's a lot of government investment in new technologies. There's also a no problem with privacy. So they have an advantage in the sense that they can just keep, keep on gathering data and data and more and more data, which gives them an advantage in technology such as AI. But on the other hand, you mentioned blockchain which is a sort of decentralized system. So which of these two systems do you think is more resilient or, uh, and more uh, has, has the advantage when it comes to the future of technology? <laughs> this is an impossible question. Nobody can answer. But if, if anybody can but answer, it, it must but be well, if you. If you, if, you, if you divide the world into two macroeconomics, right? One is, uh, I mean, capitalism with democracy. The other one is a, a state capitalism without democracy, which is China. And uh, most interesting is uh, uh, how to China handle the blockchain as a digital currency. So uh, today, 
China, if you go to China, you cannot use Facebook, you cannot use uh, Google, and you cannot, I mean, use every, everything is controlled. Okay. So I really, really feel that this is a different world. We have a two different world. So but that, that means two world. I mean, uh, the uh, demo democracy and, uh, <laughs> and capitalism also gradually need to change. And China also needs to change. So I think it's a, it's a, this is a kind of like a internet world and the real world is slightly getting closer. I think the same thing is that and it's state owned, I mean, monopoly and capitalism based on democracy is getting closer. So probably maybe create something new. Um, society. Maybe we need, maybe he's Mr. Lane's <laughs> area of way of thinking is a very philosophical thing, but I think, I mean, the reason why Donald Trump is suddenly elected as a, as a president of America is basically in America, there's a gap between 1% one, one of the rich people, I mean, making, I mean, enjoy life. But if you, left side, New York people, and right side, or left side, right side, or, or the Silicon Valley people, voted to the other people, person. So that means America, even America, there's a true economy is coexist. So if you go to China, I think there's a very poor people in agriculture, and there's a very rich people in, in the Bay Area. So I think there's a kind of huge gap exists in the two countries. So how to make it, I mean, I, I mean balance is a really big issue, and this is a badge of the SDG, or Sustainable Development Goal of the United Nations, or 17th, but I don't think America follow that. So <laughs> this is the kind of thing we have really, I mean, we have, to, we, have to, we have to discuss more about how to, how to, make, how to make a more balanced society. And we created IT and the financial industry, create, I mean, winner take all society. Yeah. So this is, this is definitely the change. So we need kind of India more growth to make a balance between China and India. And also we need Africa or Middle East how to, how to include this area for, the, for development for the future. I think this is a big, big issue. More than we follow the new, new technology, but I think this is the more fundamental needs for, for, the, for, for the whole society to talk about this issue. This is my point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I think your last question. No, no, it's over oh. on top. Okay, we have two more questions. I think we, 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 we run out of time, but we'll have two quick questions. Thank you. All right. A comment, a question. Just on the last point, uh, Claude Bigley from the Swiss Parliament. We were a couple of days uh, ago with the Fed, the bosses of the Fed in New York and Washington. Uh, they believed the future belongs to the blockchain as a trusted third party for clearing, but not to the cryptocurrency. That okay. was a very interesting statement. Now, my question was more based on Mr. Neves' uh, very interesting remark of the 50%, 100% to 100% of the emerging countries versus the traditional. Do you believe that the Trump policy may slow down that trend or not? Again, what we heard on the Hill in Washington, uh, also by Republicans, was very often the fiscal policy will be probably effective, the trade policy will be counterproductive. What are your views with the Trump's p p actual uh, policy in trying to slow down the growth of the Asian economies? Mr. Neves, they refer to you. Do you think uh, Mr. Trump's uh, <laughs> policies uh, will succeed in slowing down the, the, the shift that you talked about? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very um, difficult to see exactly what Trump's policy will be in next one or two years. What and the years impact, or days? Or hours. <laughs> I was generous. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I just would like to make no a <laughs> comment on the fiscal side. 
uh, one of the reasons why the IMF, IMF has revised upwards yeah. GDP uh, forecasts uh, was exactly the fiscal stimulus that uh, the economy, uh, the U.S. economy is, is having, and that of course uh, re revised upwardly significantly GDP growth in the U.S. but also in, in the world. And um, I mean, uh, as an economist, and once again. Uh, taking very good note of what IMF said, I mean, the first impact of the fiscal stimulus in the US around the world will be to generate more growth yeah. and a larger current account deficit in mm the -hmm. United States. That's the mm -hmm. uh, last question. Could you keep it brief, please? Thank yeah, you. I will keep it very brief. My name is Yves Dicat. I'm CEO of uh, Beiter Company in Switzerland. And um, just in the last decade, enormous amounts of liquidity have been injected in the world economy. And we have seen that also in the 1920s, which ultimately led to the Great Depression. What differences do you see between now and the 1920s? Jim, I think that's for you. You've injected a lot of liquidity in the global economy, and how is it different? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, well, and this, no, this relates to, uh, I think, this, uh, the, the, some of the risks that I mentioned at the beginning. So, so thanks. Um, <laughs> For, for bringing that up again, and, and uh, you know we do um, we, we do have very uh, unusual financial markets. I think volatility has been at a particularly low level. Risk premiums are compressed, and and we've got um, uh, and we've got uh, um, a, also this uh, this very uh, very low level of long term yields, and 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 those all seem to reflect this uh, this large amount of liquidity in the system, which uh, which has driven the search for yield, and and if we've even seen it in emerging markets. Where, uh, where it, it's also led to a buildup of vulnerabilities. But I mean, maybe not specifically compared to the 1920s, but compared to some previous episodes, the system in many ways is more resilient. I think, uh, you know, starting with the emerging markets, I mean, many of them have, have taken very uh, per, uh, sustained uh, steps to try and strengthen their positions to uh, reinforce their financial systems, to make their, their fiscal balances more, uh, more robust, to build their domestic markets so they're not as heavily reliant on on foreign financing, and that's, that means that even though I think they're going to suffer some stresses from the, uh, from the, from the uh, you know, what's happening in the, as, as, uh, as, as interest rates normalize, um, I, uh, I think they're in a better position than they were, uh, uh, you know, 20, in the 1990s, for example, which would be a good, uh, good point of comparison. Um, as far as the other, uh, other systems, I think the, uh, uh, you know, as, as uh, um, uh, as uh, has already been said, the you know the, the the banking system is 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 for a number of reasons more robust. I think the the I, th I think though what is um, what, what is uh, you know and, and the fact we we've, we've got banks that are better capitalized, they have better assured uh, sources of liquid, liquidity and so on, all should uh, help them to ride out any any fluctuations we have. I think the the one thing that's prob probably a little bit uh, uh, more concerning and, and, and is, is an unknown is, is uh, the implications of the shift of financial activity out of the banking system into asset managers and other uh, forms of market-based um, uh, financing. And those forms of financing are all heavily reliant on, on the liquidity of markets. And of course, uh, I mean, at this point, the liquidity of, of the whole system is underpinned by central banks, but market sort of own in inherent liquidity has maybe been undermined by some of the regulatory changes that have been made. So, um, so I think what remains to be seen is the extent to which those institutions and those forms of financing uh, uh, may be impacted by, the, uh, the, by the, the, the process of normalization that we're about to see. So in short, we are safer in, uh, today than we are in the, in yeah, the, I think in so. the 19, in the 20s and even the 90s. Uh, on that reassuring note, uh, uh, I think I'm sorry we have to end this, but not before we thank our panelists for a very interesting discussion. Thank you all.